to just have you state your name into the camera nice. and um, uh, tell us that we have your permission to have you on video. Okay, my name is Nancy Jones, and you do have permission to do whatever you want with this video. Perfect. And Kirk, he's on video. Oh, and Kirk. Hi, Kirk Watts, business manager for the estate. And go ahead and tape all you need to tape. Awesome. All right, well, I think you have some questions that you want to start off with. Perfect. Um, all of us would love to know a ton of information about George, but uh, I'm curious, what was your childhood like? My childhood? Yes. Well, <laughs> my childhood was really rough. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a mom that was a bipolar, so it was uh, kind of hard and a rough life growing up. And uh, I have a book coming out, so in the book that I have coming out, it starts with my childhood, which I hardly ever talk about, but it does tell of the, um, of, I guess you can say, the cruelty and the way I was raised. And in my book, I say it's uh, God prepared me for my journey in this world with uh, George Jones. So it was not a, a easy life growing up. Do you have any, um, uh key memories that, um, from your childhood that you think really did shape you to uh, become the person you are? I mean, we, we've all read in the, the book about how much you helped George out and that kind of, uh, that kind of stuff. I was just curious, really, um, is there anything that stood out to you? As a child? Yes. Growing up through your teenage years, just your life before you met George. My life before George was, uh, I, I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I didn't, uh, I hated school. I, um, uh, sorry y'all, but I, uh, you know, you I just, when you were 16 I got years married old. when I was 16 years old, uh, and only to get away from home, mm -hmm. away from my mom. And, uh, the man I married was a wonderful man mm -hmm. and he truly loved me. But I did not because I really did not know what love was. Mm -hmm. So it was a uh, kind of hard to be married and and try to figure out that you'd missed out on a childhood and now you're an adult with two kids. So it was a uh, it was a I have great kids. I had he was great. I just always thought the grass was greener on the other side or there was more to life than this. Mm -hmm. So I did divorce him, took forever because he did not want to divorce and he knew when he married me that it was not for love, it was to escape. Wow. But here's, here's a story, she doesn't like telling, so I'll tell it. Nancy's a very feisty person, oh, yeah. so at 21 years <laughs> old, she drank alcohol. Tell them. See, yes, told you. Don't want them kids it explained, to that. It explained. So at 21, the bar cut her off and said, You can't have any more. She wasn't Nancy Jones then. So she gets in her car with her friend, puts it in drive, and drives through the bar, right through the glass, right into the bar. And said, How dare you cut me off? Give me another drink. So that explains her personality. So meeting George, that feistiness is what she brought in. I was George. very feisty because I learned to be feisty from growing up. Mm -hmm. So, the word no would never kind of enter my mind. Uh -huh. You tell me no, I'm going to show you that. <laughs> I'm, Austin's laughing over there, but I'm going to show you that I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So, I don't like the word no, and probably never will. Because if there's a way to do it, you can do it if you set your mind to do it. So, that was not a good way to set my mind to do something, but... Uh, she worked I, in a factory. They garnished her wages until they... Rebuilt the bar again. <laughs> but it's okay. They were still my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Where was this bar? I know. Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay. Yeah, I'm a Louisiana girl, so maybe the Cajun and everything come out of me. I don't know what, but I, I've always been, I've always been real feisty when I was married. I don't think I can put this one in the book. Uh, my husband loved to go hunting. Love to hunt there. So I said... The first husband, not George. Right. I said, you know what? I think you should stay home with me and let's clean the house up real good. Top, bottom, the whole thing. And he said, no, I'm going hunting. 
I'm like, okay. I have worked at Western Electric there, building phones. I was tired. I didn't want to spend my whole day cleaning the house either. So when he left, I set the whole front yard up with the couch, <laughs> the chairs, the rug. I even took the freezer out there, unloaded all everything out of the freezer, pushed it out, set it out. It was a whole house out in the front yard. <laughs> what was his reaction to that? He says, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy. I have married a crazy woman. But he helped me. We put it back in. And when I asked to have help next time I got help, <laughs> I know that was mean, wasn't it? Y'all don't do that. <laughs> Did, um... So that's about how I can tell you how feisty I am or how, but I'm not that way anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm really not. But who at that time, you, mm. Maybe I was meant for George because he was as feisty as I was. <laughs> a good match. A good match. Oh, yes. <laughs> in, uh, in Shreveport, did you ever uh, go to any of the Louisiana Hayride shows? No, not really. No. i tell you why. I was not into that kind of music. Really? I was in the Credence Clearwater, man. You give me Credence Clearwater and a broom and a mop and I could clean the house up in 30 minutes, but not... <laughs> I always called it the twangy music until I got to be introduced to really country music by George Jones. Wow. We've gone since. Last year we went to Louisiana Hayride. Yeah, I went last year to Louisiana Hayride. Um, there was a lot of people on there and they had invited me to come. And I guess I looked around and said, whoa, what did I really miss? But it was fun. Very good. I just, I just found a poster the other day on Louisiana Hayride. You guys may, Odie probably knows because Odie knows everything. But Louisiana Hayride, oh yes, you guys will love it. Oh. Where is it? There it is. Right there. Featuring George Jones and Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. Yes. Nice. We, wow. we studied that. And, and Johnny, him and Johnny met down. And Johnny Cash. But that was a great time because George did not like to be outdone by Elvis. He didn't like to be outdone by anybody. <laughs> well, Elvis was a pimply faced little kid at that time, like 18 or 19, and he went out there shaking his leg, and George got mad. So he went out there and sang Long Tall Sally, Little Richard, and he's going crazy. And Elvis got mad, like, wait a minute, you're a country. Like, no, son, if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it too. So the two of them competed back and forth. Right? Yeah, and Elvis was about to cry. He told Colonel Parker, that isn't right, that George's going up there shaking his leg and doing my part. And George says, it ain't right for you to be on country music either. You need to be on the country music show. You need to go find you a rock and roll show, boy. <laughs> but they did end up being friends. Wow. We, uh, we've talked a little bit in class about George's uh, in the early years, during the, the 50s and, and even some of the early 60s, his experimentation with a little more of a rock and roll sound before really honing in his own sound. Yeah, Pappy Daly did that on him yeah. when he was trying to get him to really sell some records. So he came up with uh, Thumper Jones. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, what was it, um, Smith, his last name was Smith. He did Heartbreak and Hotel. To this day, George would argue that he didn't do the Smith. But he did because that was his mom's maiden name, and that's how they came up with that. But he did not want anybody to know he was out there doing a Thumper Jones and all of that. So he used to say, I wish I could buy up every one of those records, but they're around. That's funny. Can you um, tell us about early on in your relationship with George? Um, like, was it good? Well, yeah, tell us all about it. Well, I met him in New York through a girlfriend of mine and she was uh, dating one of his managers and uh she begged me and begged me to go to new york and i'm like i do not want to go to new york i don't care for that twangy music i'm into credence clearwater she kept calling me calling me i said okay if you just shut up i'll go <laughs> but i want my own room she said okay okay we'll take care of it so we go and what a nice guy we had so much fun talking and talking and when I went to the show, though, it was like, that's when I guess I, I liked country music, because when I got there, you know, these people were all screaming and hollering and going crazy, and man, he was singing things that 
and bending notes I didn't think that could have ever been done out of somebody's mouth. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely amazing. And so, yes, then I guess I fell hard for country music then. Oh. Well, so would you say you didn't, you weren't really a big George Jones fan before you met him? No. I uh, knew of George Jones, but no, I had no idea in my mind to be a George Jones fan or even become a George Jones fan or even knowing I was ever going to marry George Jones. But no, I was uh, not interested, didn't know hardly anything about him. So what was your first date after this encounter? Well, when we were in New York and that was on a Friday night, we left on a Sunday, uh, <clears throat> I said to him, I have to go back. I really enjoy talking to you because he's told me everything. I mean, he started from his childhood, like he was really ready to just tell everything. And we sat and talked and talked and talked. And but you didn't know it was addicted to cocaine? No, I didn't know none of that. And no. then it was like daylight and, and, and we had talked all night long. He had told me everything. And I didn't tell everything of mine. I told some, but not all of it. And then he was telling everything, how he was raised, how his dad would make him get up and sing him and his sister, and how his mom would run in the woods and hide because his dad was pitching a fit and drunk. And so that Sunday I said, I'm going back. I got to go back to work. And he said, I don't want you to go. And I'm like, well, I can't help it. I got two girls and I'm leaving. I said, go with me to the airport. And all of a sudden, it turned out to be a different person. It was like, no, I'm not going to the airport. Like, okay, you're not very friendly no more. So uh, we went to the airport, and I kept telling Linda, my friend, I said, boy, did he change. She said, I don't think he wanted you to go. I said, I don't care. It wouldn't hurt him to go to the airport. Well, I'm flying commercial. Mm -hmm. When I get home all day long flying, uh, get at the house, there was a strange car in my driveway. He had chartered a plane, rented a car, and was at my house. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Talk about someone so that's the it. thing, he moved in then. Yeah. <laughs> well, when he got there, I said, well, if you would have told me, I would have flipped with you. I mean, I am exhausted. And so he came in, I showed him the house, and he, it's a, a fixed dinner, and he said, uh, I got the same dishes. He did. Had the same dishes I had. So then I said, well, you can sleep in this room. This is my room, and I'll sleep in here with the girls. Well, I had the same bedspread. Oh, my gosh. Exactly the same one he had. And he said, man, this was meant to be. I got the same thing. <laughs> well, he stayed there for a week. Oh my God. And I had no idea that he was a no-show. I didn't even know what no-show meant, you know. I didn't know he wasn't supposed to go out and work and do all this stuff. I mean, I know you worked, but I didn't know that you didn't show up. So, yeah, he stayed there. And, and no, he did not show up. And they, Linda finally told him where he was, and they came and got him. What did your girls think? Oh, they Some loved him. strange man. They <laughs> loved him. Because when I would go to work and they'd go to school and they'd come in in the evenings, he'd already cooked. Right. He had them all going. Even the neighborhood kids loved him. So you wanted to keep him around? Oh, yeah. Was he cook. a good cook? <laughs> <laughs> was he a good cook? Yeah, he really was. <laughs> Where were you living at this time? Uh, I was in Straightport. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so what was that like having such a, like a obviously he's a celebrity, to be so vulnerable with you from the get-go. Did that stay around? Like, how do you... I did not consider George a celebrity because at that time, like I said, he was no-show. Right. And the more you get into it, you could find out that, well, shoot, I had more money than he did. <laughs> so it was like... It, I think it was then... It took over. Mm -hmm. You gotta, you gotta make him show up. Then he started drinking. You gotta quit that. Then, doing drugs, which I'd never seen. I had never even seen marijuana in my life, and thought I was tough. But I did not know what marijuana was. Did not know what cocaine was. 
and but I learned real fast. Anything I could pick up, find a book, anything I read until I learned what all it does to you. Mm -hmm. So I never considered George a celebrity until we got rid of the a lot of the evil. When did you start putting your foot down? Like when did you find it was appropriate for you? You didn't put your foot down with George Jones. <laughs> 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 but um I guess when he was getting down to 92 pounds or 90 pounds and I knew he was dying and, and, and then I had him a lot of times admitted to the hospitals and they were like, you know, he doesn't get off of this, he's going to die. But there was, there was so much, there wasn't just one evil person in George, there was like 10 evils in there. And every time I thought I had one out, it seemed like more was in there. So it was hard to, to, to get the evil out of George. So you talked about his mom or God. They were yeah, anytime he would be so bad, which when he was drinking, and, and anybody you know that's drinking, doing drugs, they've got a very mean, they're mean. It's no, I'm, oh, he didn't do this, or he, that mind don't do that. That's a lie. You're doing dr drugs and you're drinking, there's an evil in there. And an evil likes to hurt people because you know why? They're mad at their self. Mm -hmm. So that was what I uh, would fight every day. And then finally you thought you had one of them gone and then there'd be like eight or nine more in there. Mm -hmm. So you just, you just keep going and going and going until you pray a lot. You ask God to help you. Mm -hmm. I would have never made it without God. Because as, like I said, my book comes out, you will learn that uh, George got involved with the mafia out of Alabama. And they didn't like me at all. I didn't do drugs, I didn't do this, I didn't drink. So they uh, had to get rid of me. And believe me, they tried. So it was, uh, it was, it, it was hard to stay alive. Yeah. And I mean stay alive. Were you ever scared for your two daughters? I was very scared for my daughter, and I would try to make her go home, and she wouldn't do it. But my, I was scared for both of us because it got to where they thought if they could kill me or her, I would go away. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they've ever had anyone as stupid as I was, I guess, <laughs> and fight back. And I did fight back. Well, like you said, you're... No mentality, not dealing with no, it probably came in handy. Right. No, you couldn't. I will give you one example. And then, like I said, I don't want to just spill my whole book out because, but mm -hmm. when he got in with the Alabama Mafia, I got to be friends with one guy in there. His name was Big Daddy. And he was absolutely on my side, very nice. And they came one time and they kidnapped Adina, my daughter, and I'm going crazy trying to find her. And Big Daddy calls me and says, I have her, but when you go in the car, look under the uh, seat and there's a bag of cocaine, throw it out. I did, because they were trying to get me arrested. And so That's right. and I, they, they did, they were setting me up. So I went to the bar where he was and he told me where she was. And while I, I got her, put her in the car, and then, um, what was it, a day or two after they found out that I had got Adina and had George finally convinced to move to Louisiana, uh, they killed him. So they, he was going to his car and they uh, blew his head off. So this day to this day, his kids, I've read things where they're like, they wish they knew who would have killed their dad. I know exactly who killed their dad, but he, that guy that killed him, he's, he's dead too now. But I did send two of them to prison. Yeah. So, and I was, I have to say, I was still, still scared then, even married to George, and knowing I sent two to prison. During going through all that, did it ever cross your mind to, to just, leave and even leave George if you had to for the safety of yep, yourself and your it daughter. did. 
a lot of times I'd get in the car and say, I can't take it anymore, God, please. I mean, you know, this is, I wasn't raised this way. I mean, I thought I was tough, but I'm not. And uh, it's like the good Lord, like he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm helping you, go on back. But if I would have left, George would have died a long time ago, long time ago. Um, well, I guess I kind of I want to ask about publicity. I don't know what kind of publicity was going around or rumors during this time, um, but what were the worst things or maybe even the best things that you encountered and how did you face those rumors? The ones like him being so bad? Yeah. That wasn't rumors. <laughs> they were true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all of them were true. I don't know of any that were really rumors. I think the issue, the rumor he had was with his kids. They sold stuff to the tabloids. So that well, was, yeah, that was, tough. That was um, that's in the book too. But, he, you know, people will say, oh, George didn't have anything to do with his boys, which a lot of people are like, I didn't even know he had two boys. Well, in the book, it tells why he didn't have anything to do with two boys. They chose it. And you will crack up when you find out why they chose not to have their dad no more. I mean, it's so stupid, but so he never you, saw... With the rumors? It should get that. He never saw his grandkids or nothing like that. And how did I deal with the rumors? If they were true, I dealt with them. If they wasn't, I sometimes would bark on them or get back on there and, or do an interview and say that's not what happened. But then I learned, you know, the more that you talk about it, the longer it lingers, the best thing to do is just leave it alone. Tell me, George, every time there's a rumor, what would he say? Honey, if I'm in the news, that means you're talking about me. He did. He loved it. I said, did you see that? And he'll say, well, it's not true. But you know, I need that. I, I haven't been in the news in a while. <laughs> That's good. That is very good. And his favorite line, I could not understand how he could be friends with people that ripped him off or beat him up or beat me up or any of that. I would say, how, how can you even talk to those people? He'd say, honey, you kill them with kindness. You don't have to eat with them. You don't have to sleep with them. You just say, hello, how y'all doing today? And you walk right on. That was his favorite line, kill them with kindness. Well, I have to ask, what did your family and friends think about you being with George from the very start? Nobody to... liked him. Really? Nobody. Nobody liked him. And you know what? That made me fight more. Mm -hmm. Because I knew there was a good man in there. Mm -hmm. I just had to get the demons out. But none of my friends liked him because of, I wasn't there to run and do things with them. And I wasn't with my family to work and give them my paycheck. So... No, they did not like him, but I, I just fought harder. What was that thing about him that you wanted to fight for? Because when he wasn't drinking, just like at the house with the kids, mm -hmm. wonderful man. Mm -hmm. Loved to laugh, loved to joke, loved to, I mean, loved his mother. He was just a wonderful man. He was funny. Very fun and funny. Mm -hmm. What was your relationship with his mom like? I didn't know his mom. She she died before I was around. But I, I thought he ever talked about when he was messed up. Mm -hmm. was his mom. You could always calm him down with his mom or talk about the Bible. So if you can talk to somebody about the Bible that's higher on a kite, then there's something good in there. Mm -hmm. Do you think those uh, that first weekend of New York is really what showed you his good side? I mean... You said it, it was great, it was friendly, you guys talked for hours, and then it was when you wanted to go to the airport that things kind of shifted. Yeah, it did. Yeah. But I, I uh, he just, he told me everything, I guess. I think it, you could feel that he wanted to get that off his chest. Mm -hmm. And when uh, we, he quit talking, he said, you know, I've never ever taught anybody all this. So I think it was time to get it out. Okay. And I was glad that I was the one that he was comfortable enough to tell me these kind of things. But then I did see the change whenever, some people would say spoiled rotten uh, when he didn't want me to leave. But then if you stop and think about it, 
I think I was more of his comfort zone, okay. and his comfort zone was leaving. Can you tell us about your wedding, Ben? My wedding? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great story. He's going to love this. Okay. We had already moved to Texas then by his sister and his brother-in-law, which he loved, Helen and Uncle Doug. And uh, I'm in the garden planting because we will have a garden. I mean, I was going to be this uh, lady Green. that's going to get us some fruit out there and some, <laughs> some beans and some peas. And so anyway, and he's out there cutting down trees and stuff. So he comes to the house. He's all sweaty and everything. And he said, hey, I said, what? If you want to be Mrs. George Jones, you better go get a shower and let's go to Helen. She's got a preacher over there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So get a shower. We both, we go over there and there's just Helen, Uncle Dub, and the preacher, me and George. And we both are so skinny because we've been running and hiding and trying to build a country music park. And mm -hmm. <laughs> he laughs because it looked like it looked like we were like I was, it must have been pregnant or something because nobody was smiling. It was like mm -hmm, she got to get married. I used to leave that right now. <laughs> but there. They don't look happy. It looks like a funeral. Oh my god. There's no smile. No. That's at the doesn't. altar. That is hysterical. Isn't that pitiful? Yeah. Sure. Then we went to Burger King, got us a hamburger, and went back to work. I'm I <laughs> passing it around. Are you? No. Heck no. no. He's got it. They're, they're going to see it next week in class. Okay. <laughs> well, you would think, oh, poor woman, she's pregnant, and they're making her get married to that guy. Well, trust me, I wasn't pregnant. But, um, and you went to Burger King for dinner? We did. I told him went to Burger King. Got a hamburger, went right back to Jones Country and went to work. <laughs> that was it. That's, crazy. That's important to know because he didn't have money. He had twenty dollars through his I had more than he did. So people now when they beat her up on Facebook, you married him because he was famous. He has no money when she married him. Right. <laughs> if only those people that do that, like I said in the book it will tell. George was so far gone in his mind, I have to say, that uh before I came along, he'd already invented. He'd already invented two characters to keep him company, which in his mind he really thought they were real. He had an old man and a duck, and they always rode in the back seat. And then this really, you, then you'll see how far gone he was. The old. The old man and the duck would get in the biggest arguments in the back seat, just dip, 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 and he talked just like an old man, and he talked just like a duck. So I'm, you know, I'm like, oh Lord God, what have you put me here for? But um, I just got tired of it. I mean, it was always the old man and the duck. They were fighting. They were fussing. They were this. So we was on our way to Birmingham three times that one day, and I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm tired of hearing this mess. <laughs> So I said, pull the car over. He said, what? I said, pull the car over. Okay. He pulls the car over, and I play like, this is somebody saying us, they'd say she's gone too. She's out of here. I am playing like I'm pulling out the old man. I'm pulling out the dog. Oh I'm going to leave him on the side of the interstate. The bed is open, and she's yeah. like, I'm going to leave him on the side the interstate over here. I don't want to see him no more. Well, then the little duck would run back in there, and he was hollering, he's in here, the duck's in here. I got him, I got him, I got him. Just don't even look. Pull the old duck out. Pull the old man out. And then, after three tries, I'm like, I get in the front seat, go, I've got him over there, they're gone, they're gone. Never heard of them again. Wow. Oh, wow. Is that not crazy? He kicked them out. I'm not sure she wasn't as crazy as George was. I mean, she played with invisible people. Well, I had to get rid of them. Shut up, Austin. I had to get rid of them. There's some poor old man and a duck on the road halfway to Birmingham. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Nancy he was the type that whenever he would drink or do drugs, he wanted to drive. Just drive. It doesn't matter where it was. Just get in his car and go, 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 go. Well, that's the worst time in the world to drive high and drunk. So we had to stop that, but we finally did. 
Were you at the Exit In show when he came out and sang in the duck voice? Was that before y'all met? Were you at the Exit In show when he... When he, when he, when he did the whole show yeah. with the old man and the duck? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Because there's just a little bit of a count of it, but that's a real important part of his history. That was at the Executive Inn, wasn't it? Uh, they, I think it says ex Exit Inn. Exit Inn, you're right. And um, he didn't want to do the show anyway. So there he is talking to the old man and the duck. That was before I got rid of him. So he was just talking up a storm to him. And finally I said, you need to go do the show. Let's just go so we can leave. Okay. He said, y'all come on. I'm like, what is he doing? He went on the stage. He sung his show in the voice of the old man in the duck. <laughs> and yes, people were looking at him like he was crazy. And yes, at that time, he was. He was too far gone. That's when I put him back in the hospital. Were the, were the people in the crowds visibly sad? Laughing. Laughing. Mm. Laughing which hurt more because this was a sad situation. I mean, this, the man was too far gone. Mm -hmm. And it was, I'm, I'm begging to God help me, you know, what do I do now? But uh, that's all gone. I mean, it, it ended up being an, a nice life after he hit the bridge in 99. And so I got from 99 to 2013, a good husband. Coming from experience with an addict in my family, I know how it feels to just like have that. It's not even embarrassment. It's just like you want everyone to know the good side of them. And I couldn't imagine what that's like watching him on stage. I did want everyone to know the good side of George because there was a good side. There was a funny side. Um, I think that's why that I got so angry with the George and Tammy series. Mm -hmm. That was supposed to be out of Georgette's book, mm -hmm. which is nothing in that book like that. Nothing. But I guess they had to Hollywood it up, I guess. Mm -hmm. But he didn't shoot the bus up. And I only watched that one part. After that, I could not watch anything else. I was told by a lot of people what was in there. And it's all lies. And to me, in my heart, how could you sell your mother and your father as them, the legends they were, and great, great entertainers, mm -hmm. the way that they were sold on that series, which was all lies. And someday I will correct that. It's just not time right now. But... Uh, because I have the 10th anniversary going of Georgia in Huntsville, Alabama with 30 artists right. on it. And they're all going to sing one or two songs of George. It's just not the time to just blood, put this out and put it. In the book, you're, you're book you're In the book, I do. In the book. But after all of this is done, and some people are still saying, I thought you were going to tell us what you thought of the show. I will. Mm -hmm. And, but... I think it was wrong, and I call it, and I'll always will, the almighty dollar. Mm -hmm. And I was going to sue them, but you can't, because right at the end, it says that it was... We took liberties and made up a lot of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, we took the liberty, liberties <laughs> and made up a lot of stuff. Well, they sure did make it up. <laughs> but I, if, I mean, if I would watch it, I could tell you, true, false, true, false. I can tell you what was true, what is false. That's not that you were jealous. You loved Tammy Wynette. I did. George hated her, but you loved I her. got along with Tammy Wynette. And George would tell me, you're going to get in trouble because she ain't nothing but trouble. <laughs> she lies, she does this, she does that. And I'm like, I like her. Mm -hmm. So when I would go to visit Tammy, I, he went with me a couple of times. He was like, well, she just said everything she said in that kitchen's a lie. Well... Then I was like, you're not going no more. I will go over there because she'd make biscuits and me and her sit and talk. And I, I I, just liked her, you know. I didn't have anything against her. She hadn't done anything to me. Mm -hmm. And George and Tammy were like, whew. I've never seen two people 
despise each other. But they could get on the stage, and my God, they ought to be in the movies. I'd never seen two people to act like they loved each other. And as soon as that show was over, she's over here griping and cussing, he's over here griping and cussing, and I don't want to do it the next show tomorrow night with her. I'm like, yeah, you are. She's yeah, you crying because he's yelling she's at her. She's crying because he's yelling at her and telling me to unplug everything because she went over 15 minutes. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I, it, was the, it was the tour from hell. I'm sorry, but that's what it was. That's but I liked her. Pretty amazing. You can put your emotions aside and be friends with her regardless if you have hard I got along with her. I had no problem with her. I want to ask a question. I can't help but jump in sometimes with some of your stories. Can you talk about working with George Ritchie? Did y'all do business? George Ritchie. George Ritchie. Talk about working with George Ritchie. Did y'all do business, Nancy? I, I worked with George Ritchie on the album one. George Ritchie loved money. Plain and simple. I mean, he loved money and he knew how to make money. But he, um, you know, sometimes you get so aggravated it's like, there's more to life than just money. But as far as George Ritchie, I had no problems with him. He always treated me right. I, I guess I felt like that with the drugs that Tammy was on, I felt like she needed to be so far from him and that one doctor and, and get her off of those drugs that she was on because she was on Versed. So, yes, I uh, would preach to him about that, and he would tell me that was none of my business, but I felt like it was. And I was on a kidnapper one time, but she called me and begged me not to. But <laughs> I felt like that she needed to go somewhere to get off of what they all had her on. Wow. That's tough stuff. Um, well, everyone knows that marriage is teamwork and takes effort on both sides. Uh, what were some things that you'd do to make your relationship stronger with George? To make a relationship stronger, first, God, mm -hmm. praying. Second, no nagging. Third, believe in your husband. Mm -hmm. Because that's what life is about. If he, Even if he's wrong, believe him in, until you can convince him that he's wrong. Mm -hmm. But don't just blurt it out. That's not right. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. You have to have patience mm -hmm. with, especially at that time with a man that was drinking and, and drugs and stuff. It, it, they don't like, they don't like you to scream at them, holler at them or disagree with them. You just agree with them and knowing in your heart that it's wrong, but that way to make a perfect marriage is nothing but the good Lord. Mm -hmm. You gotta be feisty. Well, Tom and George would honk in the garage. They don't understand how you broke George. George was the type that, I, okay, jump up, put his jeans on, put his baseball cap on, let's go to Cracker Barrel. Well, I got to put some makeup on and some clothes. Honey, hurry up. Okay. Well, he's in the garage honking the horn. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. So, y'all don't do this, okay? So it stopped him. Cold turkey after this, he never, never did, it, did again. it again. I got enough of it. I come through the house in my bra and panties. No clothes on. Bra I bra had a bra and panties. Bra and panties. I go and get in the car. Well, while I'm heading that way, the housekeeper's like, "Oh no, Miss Nancy, no, no, shut up, Mama." So I go. I get in the car and I slam the door. Well, he's mad and he's looking straight ahead. So. The driveway from our house to the gate was a very long way. About half a mile. And I'm like, oh my God, please don't let him go through that gate. Okay. He'll take me to town this way. <laughs> we go down there, gets on, fixing to get on 96. He stops and he looks over at me and he went, go put you some clothes on. <laughs> I said, you quit honking the horn. I back to the house and I got dressed. He never honked the horn again. <laughs> so y'all don't really do that, but. It was fun. So it was sometimes fun. you got to put your feet down and you learn a lesson, you know? It's better than saying stop honking the horn. So, that's just about my life. <laughs> that is hysterical. But, uh, well, another funny thing, Billy Yates yesterday, he mentioned, we talked about how he cut your guys' hair. 
Um, the one story about the first time he went over to your house to cut George's hair and George didn't want his hair cut. Do you remember that story? I don't know what she said. Well, first time Bill Yates came to the house and George didn't want his hair cut. Remember that? He didn't want his hair did cut? Did not want it cut. Because he didn't know Billy knew how to cut hair. They were very particular with his hair. <clears throat> yeah. It had to be the same he, person. It had to be the same person. I mean, it had to be just right. It had to be so much hairspray. If the tornado came through, it wouldn't have blown George's hair. But no, he did not want Billy to do his hair. Billy did my hair. That is so funny. But, uh, and it would have been great because Billy could have traveled with us and everything. But oh no, he had a girl that lived in Alabama that drove from Alabama to the house every other day to fix his hair. Oh my gosh. And then she traveled on the bus with us. Wow. So they, he was very particular about his hair. Can you tell us a little bit about life on the bus? Life on the bus. Well, uh, life on our bus after we really got one that was worth having, mm -hmm. it was great. I mean, you got, you had an oven, you had a microwave, you had a shower, you had a king size bed, you had TVs everywhere and a couch and his recliner. And so it was like traveling on a home. If, if you go, if you go to the George Jones Facebook page, we recently put up a video from CMT, uh, the bus, and CMT interviewed Nancy and George. They're, they're going to see it. We just hadn't got there in the class, okay. but yeah. I've got that video. So, there we go. Is there any uh, favorite memory from being on tour? Being on the bus? Being on tour? Yeah. There were some good members, some bad members, I guess. A favorite. Canada was probably cool. My favorite, I guess, we were sitting on the bus. Well, he never went to the hotel room while we stayed on the bus. Well, why? We had everything there. And, um, we was in Canada, and uh, I looked out there and I said, George, look at those kids. I said, every one of those, about 10 kids out there, they have cancer. Their heads were shaved. He said, oh, honey. I said, isn't that awful? So I said, I'm going to give them a T-shirt and a CD and a cap. He said, okay. So I go under the bay, which was heavy to pull it up. But I'm pulling up that bay, and I'm getting 10 T-shirts, caps, CDs. I bring them on the bus. George is signing them. So Bobby, the road manager, comes out and says, What are you doing? I said, Look at those kids out there. They all have cancer. He said, No, they don't. I said, Yes, they do, Bobby. I want this autographed and give to them. He said, They all have head lice. And they have head lice. They shave their heads. They shave their heads. <laughs> Oh, I still gave them their stuff. But I thought they had cancer. I've never seen anybody shave your head because you had head lice. Yeah. So that was a funny one. And then if we had played anywhere, I always sell concessions. Oh, that was my favorite. I used to go out there and meet the people, uh, sell concessions and uh, sign autographs. And uh, anytime there was a, anybody in a uniform, I don't care if it was Army, Navy, whatever it was. I didn't say you get it free. I, uh, they, they go to pay for it after they picked out what they wanted. I said, you don't know for that. Thank you for your service. Well, Bobby went on the bus and told George one night, he said, I hope we never play Fort Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Give away everything. I would. That is so funny. Go ahead. Just... You, you're sharing so many stories that are great. Is there, is there one in particular that that you just always go back to when you think of George? Is there one memory that sticks out? Yep. In 1999, whenever George came out of the hospital and where we lived, you could you'd walk down and there'd be a bridge right there on the property. So we were walking down that day and he was out of breath. He couldn't breathe good. And he sat on that little bridge and he said, Honey, I can't walk no further. I said, Well, I'll go get the golf cart. He said, Go get the golf cart and let me go to the house. When I was leaving, I heard him pray to God that if you let me live through this, I'm gonna cry, <laughs> that I will never smoke another cigarette, I will never drink. I will never do anything bad. And uh, guess what? He never did. 
But that's another yeah, point you've heard all the time. But that day, oh, you I used to hear it. it all the time. I quit. I'll never do that again. I promise you. If you don't leave me, I promise I'll do this. I won't do that. I quit. Well, you know, you like, yeah, sure. Tomorrow you'll be drunk again. But that one, it was like God said, He's telling the truth. Well, in his book, he obviously gives you a lot of credit for saving his life. But you credit it to God? Oh, I do. Yes. There is no way that I could have thought. I wish there were way people, all of y'all could see what I was in and how I fought to get out of it. But without God on my side every single day, there's no way I would have made it. And the reason you never left him, because you saw a good guy, you wanted oh, to make yeah. sure he got to heaven. I just had to get those demons out to put him to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's why you never left. And that, to me, I felt that was my journey from childhood to now. It's, it, you know, in the beginning you were talking about your childhood, and you, you said it was a, a hard upbringing. It was. And, I think about how George himself had a pretty hard upbringing, but I think it's kind of a, a, a beautiful mixture that his hard upbringing um, set him on a path of drugs and alcohol and being hard on himself, but your tough upbringing set you on the path that, that saved right. him from that. Right, right. You know? Exactly. Two bad situations. And right. the crazy thing is his dad was an alcoholic, and he hated his dad, yeah. and became just like him. Yeah. We run into so many people that go to her, it's like, my dad was an alcoholic, I hated him, and now I'm an alcoholic. You think you go the opposite way, but they end up being just like them. And George realized. Them do. I hated my dad for it, now I'm just like him. Yeah. Um, this is a kind of off topic, and unless you want to keep going. I keep you said, go right um, <laughs> On the lighter side, outside of his career, did you guys have any desire to enjoy music together? You mean his music? No, just any music. No. No? No. <laughs> no, he did not. Uh, when he was not on the stage singing or in the studio, he would play gospel music in the car, not from the radio, but from a CD. Mm -hmm. Let's set the record straight. His number one love was NFL football. Oh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. More than music. Did. If he was on stage, if she didn't show the score every 15 minutes, he would get off stage. But as far as music, no. Love football. But, God, he was ate up with football. I never seen nothing like it. And <laughs> nobody would watch TV with him because he, he would bet on every game. And you flip it and mm -hmm. flip it. I'm like, okay, which one is that? I just go in there and watch it yourself. No, I mean, which one are you, are you winning, you're losing? He would bet on every single game. There would be X's here. An arrow going over here. I mean, his book was like that. It was crazy. And you know what I did? I put it in the museum when we had the museum, his little book where he was playing football. And Lord and behold, if I didn't have the book, his number on there. And Kirk said, who is that? I went, oh my God, get that book out. That's the book he's not <laughs> But you would lie when he's on stage. If you knew his team was losing, you'd put it in as he won. <coughs> Otherwise, he would have left the stage. I would. I would. She would say, lie to him. Here's the score. score. You're winning. What's the score? Not really. <laughs> so I'd have to go get a piece of paper. If it was Dallas and they were losing, I would say, look, they're winning. They're winning. <laughs> Keep singing. Um, the other day, I was on the phone with Janie Fricky. Uh, uh, three-time female vocalist, 18 number one hits, who's, on, who's actually on the Huntsville show, and she was George's opening act for three years, and she told the story the other day. She said there was a late football game that was going to start at 9 o'clock one night, and that's what time George was slated to go on. Janie said, so that night I was the closing act. How many of you have been to a concert and the big act is the last act? When the football game was happening, George said, no, I'm going on at 7, you go on at 9. So everybody came and saw George at the beginning, and Janie had to follow, and people were leaving because... They didn't care about her at the time. She was not the big star. He was. But if the football game happened at late, he, he didn't go on stage. Oh, no. He, he begged somebody to go on before him. It was Randy, uh, Randy Travis he did that to. Mm -hmm. Please, just go. Just close. Just close. Randy came on one day. He was about to cry. George, please, please don't do that to me. 
come on, Randy, man, you've been out there long enough. They love you. You'll be just fine. I'm like, oh, my God, poor Randy. <laughs> but he did. He did all that. So after being at all those shows, did you have a favorite song in particular? My favorite song? Mm -hmm. My favorite song is Walk Through This World With Me. And someday my day will come. Because when he would be really messed up, I got so tired of hearing, someday my day will come. So, <laughs> I'm like, okay, it finally came. <laughs> so, when, do you listen to his music now? At all? Uh, every now and then, but not, no, because it's too sad. Yeah. It's too sad. I'm sure. sure. I'll be crying the whole time in the Huntsville, I can tell you that, mm. with all them people singing his songs. Um, well, this back to you. Um, it's understood that you created the George Jones Memorial Scholarship, um, other than him being your husband. What was the inspiration behind that? I got some of hers. The, what's the inspiration behind the scholarship at MTSU for George? Because I would say it is something to carry his legacy. And a lot of things that, um, you know, I'm sure that like their mom, their father will like say, we love George Jones, but he did this and he did that. Well, set the record straight. Let's tell the truth, what he did do, what he didn't do. But yet this carries his legacy and it's, his music was just unbelievable. I mean, the man could take a song and be in notes that no one else could and it just looks so easy. And any anyone that well, we'll do a George Jones song. We'll tell you that it is so hard to sing a George Jones song. But it was to him, it was just, it just came out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. God gave him that music because he never, ever had voice lessons. Mm -hmm. He he could play, which people didn't know, he could play the piano, he could play the fiddle. And the only time he played the fiddle was when we worked Louisiana, Cajun. And, uh, but uh, it was something God gave him. I mean, I, I say to this day, he's in heaven singing with the angels. And they're probably going, wow, he's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely for sure. Do you have any um, When can we expect to see your book? I, uh, September the 12th, on his birthday. Aww. It will be out. And like I said, there is so much that has been told on George that's not true. So I'm kind of straightening that out. I'm telling why people think he wasn't a good dad, but he had a reason that's in there. And some things, I mean, to, like Georgette, I'm not going to put her down too bad today, but she goes out and she sings her dad's song. She sings her mom's songs. They were never close. I tried so hard to get them close. And every time I would do, get them to even speak in terms, the next thing I know, she's done this, she's done that. And it just, uh, he, <laughs> he made the remark one time, this is why I should have named my kids. Drunk, drunker, drinking, Drunkers. and drunkest. I'm like, oh, that's me. But there is a one. Her name is Susan. She is my favorite. She is the first daughter. The other kids do not claim her at all. They haven't seen Susan in probably 45, maybe 50 years. Mm -hmm. She is the sweetest thing. She has her dad's mannerism. She's just like him and just precious and we have been friends since the day i entered that family so mm. susan and her kids she has a girl and a boy and they're all married now and have kids but they know nothing except i'm the grandmother and the mother so mm. that's that's where we are with them that's really sweet i love them well thank you for writing the book to set things straight well I I think a lot of people are will appreciate that, you know. I'm excited about the book, and uh, then they put something on me yesterday because I am not very good at speaking, but they want me to do the... Uh, E-book, the audio book, yeah. 
I'm like, oh my gosh, I'll be like Loretta. Well, let me tell y'all what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can do it. They're breaking down oh, by chance. I don't know. Exactly. I worried about that all night last night. I'm like, I just want to put a book out there. I don't want to talk. <laughs> but I have one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the class, if you don't mind. If you had one word to describe George, and you wanted one thing the world for the world to know, what would that be? That George Jones had a heart of gold. If there was anything you needed, he would give it to you. That's way more than one word, but keep going. He would. Um, he was funny. He would give you the shirt off his back. He was funny. He was kind. He was loving. I mean, I could go on and on and on because all of that describes George Jones. People don't realize he carried five thousand dollars in his front pocket every day, and he would drive down the road and see a little kid playing. He would stop the car, call him over, give him hundred dollar bills, and every time he drove by, the kids would be at the road like, <laughs> 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 we're getting, we're getting more than mine, and they ought to make it and today. And they moved, and it broke George's heart because he loved that little kid. But that's how he was. He was just a, he just had a heart that was huge, huge. Before we open I can tell you, I will leave this with y'all and then you could ask me questions later, but I'm gonna leave this with you. You know, I worked so hard in my heart to know that George went to heaven, okay? And I really think he did. So when George had talked two or three days in the hospital, hadn't said a word, and uh, I'm, they're rubbing his feet and the doctor comes by and he says, I'm going to go home and I'll be back later because he won't make it till daylight. And I'm like, oh, don't leave me here. And he's like, no, I'll be back. So when the doctor came back, I was rubbing George's feet. And to show you George's mannerism, he said, well, hello there. And that deep voice he had, he said, well, hello there. I've been looking for you. My name is George Jones, and he died. It was your closure that he found so God. That was he introduced closure. himself to God and just got to know And he would have done that. He would have been that type to say, to introduce himself to God, that would have been George. Yes. And now you can cry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's all that thing for you. Before we open it up to the class, I've got some questions I got to throw in here because I need some answers. Um, <laughs> uh, we hadn't talked about certain things and they come up from time to time. I'll, I'll talk louder. I, I've got some questions. Uh, you and, When Johnny Paycheck died, you and George bought, uh, Johnny died penniless, and you and George paid for Johnny Paycheck's burial, his plot, and y'all bought 30 more plots for other musicians. Uh, 68. 68. 68, I'm sorry. 68. 68. Can you talk about George and Johnny's relationship, their friendship? What did you see? Well, you know, Johnny worked for George when he was uh, yes. uh, Donnie Lytle. Donnie Lytle and Donnie yeah. Young. Yeah, Donnie Young, you're right. And they were always very, very, very close. So even bad times, good times, it didn't matter. There was always, it was like that with them too. So uh, when he died, you know, had all those plots out there. Well, you took care of him. You did his laundry. Oh, and... I would go to the hospital, get his laundry and stuff. And he'd say, thank you, thank you, I love you. I said, oh, shut up. Quit using so many pajamas. <laughs> so I was, he was just a sweetheart. But, uh. George bought all them plots out there. So one day I told him, George, we don't need all these plots. This is crazy. He said, honey, I'm not going to be crowded out here. <laughs> so, I mean, he was going to be dead. How did he know if he was going to be crowded? But we still have the plots, and Johnny's still out there. You know what's interesting about that, Nancy? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, George being from the big thicket, I found some... Uh, uh, research some documentaries on the big thicket and it talks about people didn't like being crowded and they liked being isolated where they were out there and they had an old timer in that and he said if you're my neighbor come on up my drive but if I don't know you don't come crowding and they had that whole culture down there is they didn't want to they didn't want people That's true. All around them. yes so, so I guess that was just pounded in his head so the other I want to talk about a couple other relationships the next one there's a picture I love 
of Merle Haggard and George sitting on a swing and Haggard's leaned over with his fishing cap kissing George on the cheek. Can you talk about George and Merle Haggard's friendship? Oh, they were very, very close also. George used to tell him all the time, son, why don't you move to Nashville? You're out there in that foreign country because he lived in California. But no, um, Haggard loved George's music and George loved Haggard's music. And then they did that one album, Yesterday's Wine and all that. But that was the day they were doing an album together then when they were out there on that swing at the at the studio. It's a sweet picture. It's uh -huh, really, it really is. nice. Uh, the other person I want to talk about, uh, because I know what an impact he had on George's career, but also when y'all had the unveiling of George's uh, headstone, is uh, he was there, and that's Billy Sherrill. Oh, gosh. Can you talk about what George George's feelings and, and what George had to say about Billy? Billy Sherrill was the sweetest man ever. He had more patience with George than anybody ever in the studio. And he just, when George would be messed up or wouldn't sing right, Billy just let him get in there and do what he wants to do, and he knew a couple of days later he'd make him overdub and do it the right way. So he was, that, they were just close, but some of the songs Billy would pick, George was like, I'm not singing that song, I don't like it. Well, then when Billy get in there and do the arrangement on it, George was like, well, that sounds pretty good, but don't you put no horns on there. Well, he did put horns on one one time. Uh, I think it was uh, George and Brenda Lee. And George went in. I'm calling him up. I'm going to tell him off. I said, just listen to it. And he did. And he's like, well, it don't sound too bad. <laughs> but no, him and Billy were extremely close. And you and Billy were close. Oh, gosh, yes. Very close to Billy Sherrill. Um, and Billy's out there, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Billy and Jerry Chestnut. And the... the uh, it's interesting to me to read that George was a great decorator and enjoyed decorating. And I he always did. wanted to ask you about that. He did. He did. He would buy a house or get a new house. He was like, that don't look good. That's, that's crowded. Well, sometimes it, I didn't like what he did, but I let him do what he wanted to do. But his best thing was outside flowers and plants and he could, he, our yard looked like a golf course. But yes, he was good at that too. Did he ever say where he, where that came from? Uh, being that he came from a hand hewn, you know, a shack that his dad built. Where did his love of decorating and, and I've heard several people or read where several people said, George Jones could decorate. Did I it, where, don't know where it came from, but he was good at it. Very good. What would you say his style was? Well, we got him out of that uh, Spanish style. <laughs> <laughs> you two must have had similar tastes since he had the same dishes yeah. and the same items. Right? He, he loved Spanish for a while. And then whenever I tell him, it's so dark. I mean, why do you want red and black? And mm -hmm. finally he looked back one day and said, you know, you're right. Let's go get some light stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was easy to work with. We're talking about decorating. They did the Christmas decorations every oh, year. Yeah. George hated it. Honey, why do you keep doing all that? It takes months. It's crazy. So they go to Cracker Barrel. People are like, George, I love your lights. Oh, thank you. He acted like it was all him. He, he was fighting her the whole time. I did that. So I got one more question before we open up to the class now that Hadley and, and Will have done theirs. The last question I want to ask you about, he talks about it a little bit in his book. But there was a day, you know, we all know how much Hank Williams meant to him. And there was a day when he was working at the radio station that he met Hank. Did George ever talk about the, his short time with Hank that day at all or, or much about him? KTXJ? Yes. He did. Um, Hank uh, was doing the show that day in the radio station. So they told him, they said, George, look, you can, you can pick your guitar with Hank today. You're kidding me. I said, no. So we'll get there. He said he got there and uh, Hank starts singing and he looks at George and George said he'd go, tell George to hit a lick, you know? Mm -hmm. And George said, I couldn't do nothing. My mouth was wide open and I was like, <laughs> and he never hit a lick. And then afterwards, he said he told Hank, I, I just couldn't do it. So that night when Hank was doing the show, he said, Will you dedicate, I forgot what song it was, uh, to me tonight? He said, man, I, I'm going to be at your show. Well, it was in a big old tent. 
and George said he didn't have no money, so he crawled under the tent, you know, to go to the show. And Hank saw him, and he said, "Y'all see that little boy over there?" And, and he was at my at the radio station. His name's George Jones, and I'm gonna dedicate this song to him. And someday he's gonna be a big star. And George said, "Man, I got my face got red. I didn't know what to say, but I couldn't do nothing but stare at him the whole time he was singing." So I thought that was pretty cool. Besides Hank, I said one last one, but I got one more. Besides <laughs> Hank, Roy, and Lefty, did George ever talk about anybody else? No, nope. Hank, those? Roy, and Lefty. That was yeah. it. And when he first started out, he tried to sing like Lefty. Mm -hmm. And that's when Pappy Daly said, we already have a Lefty, George. Then he tried to sing like Hank. Uh, and Hank told him, George, I already can sing my own songs. You pick your own way to sing. And that's when he started changing and doing George Jones' way. Well, does anyone have any questions? They probably say, tell her to shut up. <laughs> I have a couple questions. The first is like, like did how often did George like play music for you? Like whenever it was just y'all two at home. How Did George ever play music for just you two at home? No. No. Uh -uh. And the second one is, like, did he, would he ever get, like, tore up, like, if his lawn's not ever looking good? Or... Oh. <laughs> but that... Did he get tore he get up upset if his lawn didn't look good? Oh, yes. His laundry? The lawn. The lawn. Oh, oh, my God. You know what? <laughs> they would get they the had... grandkids four-wheelers, but if you went on the grass, you're out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what would have, like... Probably eighty to a hundred acres out there. One hundred twenty. Everything was had was paved all the way through, so the kids would get four wheelers for Christmas. You had to ride it on the paved part. If you ever got off of there, he would grab you and take your uh, four wheelers away, <laughs> which was so stupid. I mean, nobody was at the back forty or whatever, but oh, he'd go find them tracks. And he loved cutting the grass, but they had bad allergies, so he'd cut it. Come in the house, he got a singer next day, like, oh, she's like, I told you not to cut the grass. And he, he loved doing it, but oh, he allergy. loved it. He thought he'd wear that mask and be fine. I said, that is not. You're going to be so stopped up tomorrow. <laughs> sure enough, he was. Anybody else? Anybody else? So in his book, I Live to Tell It All, was there anything um, that if you read it, was there anything in it that you kind of went, I remember that differently, or you had a different perspective on it, the way he described yeah, it? I lived to tell it all book. Anything in there that you would have said was not 100% right? I don't think so. I really think that was that was pretty true. I mean, a lot of, whenever I read it, I'm like, God, they, got, they shouldn't put that in there. But it was the truth, so why not? Just like my book's going to be the truth. It's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. And it hurts me now to think about what's going in there. Mm -hmm. But I want the truth out. I mean, I'm 75 years old. It's time somebody tells the truth. You're 74. That's okay, same okay. thing. <laughs> <laughs> round up. Thing. Hey, round up, yeah. Um, I, I don't even want to be that old. One last question. Um, what was your day-to-day, -day, like, what was your favorite thing to do, just you two? With George? Mm -hmm. Well, cook. Now, he did help a lot in the kitchen cooking, making up stuff that sometimes I didn't think it was going to be worth a darn, and it turned out pretty good. Put some peas here, some corn here, some potatoes here, ground meat here, I mean, and put it all in the oven, which was, that was really good. But he loved to cook and just ride around and on the ride four wheelers. Now, he loved that. I did too, through the mud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was our life. Well, I think I, I got I've got lots oh, of questions. You know, that's what I was looking so at. Uh, we're about to hit the '90s, and something I've never asked you before. And it's obviously that when you came in, that you were uh, kind of the business mind and the operation. And I got to ask you, what was the most successful? George Jones sausage, George Jones pet food, or George Jones water? Pet food. Uh, the sausage was good. The pet food was very good. We got into Walmart and oh my God, they, when we went and met with people at Walmart, they said, we'll put you in there. 
But if you outsell Roy, you're out. Which is their store brand. We outsell little Roy. We got out. They kicked him out. We had some good checks. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did a deal. I guess it was with Sausage with Camping World or something. I was like, that's no, next sausage level. Sausage was with William Sausage. Oh, with William yeah. Sausage. Okay. And then there was Camping World, but it. Your water did good, then they changed it on you. Yeah, Camping World didn't do that good, but with the, the water, now the water was doing really good. And uh, it never got in stores, though, but it was doing really good. Everybody was wanting the water. I mean, it was everywhere. And the small was like Piggly Wiggly and that kind of stuff. And it was doing really good. And then that, what, what did you call it? Um, not a creek. Wherever he was getting the water. Spring? It went. The spring? Yeah, the spring. It went dry. Oh. So. But they didn't tell you. No. So one day, they brought some water to the house. And I said, I taste it. And I said, this water don't taste right. So. <laughs> I told George, and George said, no, that's not spring water. They were taking it out of the faucet. So that's when I said, no more. We're not doing that water no more. And it was doing good. So? So I asked you about, we talked about Merle Haggard and Johnny Paycheck and Billy Sherrill and their relationships. I know that when George was in the hospital the last time, Alan Jackson came to see him. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to ask you about their relationship, like, Alan's known to be a quiet man. What did George and Alan talk about when they were together spending time? What was their relationship? They like? didn't talk about a whole lot. Because <laughs> George but was no, quiet, too. Because George is very quiet. Very quiet man. And uh, I used to, he used to say, if you want to know something, ask my wife. She'll never shut up. But Alan and George just hit it off. Even when before Alan became to be who he is, we were, used to always go and meet him at the uh, Cockle Walk. And uh, people would always want George's autographs. We got all around us getting autographs. George said, y'all need to get that boy's autograph. He's going to be a big star someday. Nobody even got his autograph. But then George always acknowledged Alan. And they just, Alan would come to the house and go in his little back room back there with George and they just watch TV. Sometimes they talk, sometimes they didn't talk. But he was always close to George. You mentioned Pappy Daly earlier. Uh, did George talk, you know, we learned recently in the class that in about a five year period when George was on Music Corps, he cut like 287 songs on George. Like they, Pappy Daly work, worked him. Did he ever much talk about their relationship or business? Or? He did at first, but at the end, they um, he kind of noticed that Pappy was making more money than he was. So that's kind of where their relationship drifted off. A lot of people were making more money than George. Because <laughs> George just didn't, he didn't understand the business. Sure. But I have to back up on that. He taught me a lot about it. Who to trust, who not to trust. And... I'm really good now that uh, I can look at somebody and say, mm -mm, that's a crook, you know, and he taught me how to notice that, how to do that. But then I have to say, oh, it's got to kill him with kindness. <laughs> but no, that's how he was. He, he did teach me a lot. And he always, always said that the record labels have two sets of books. That was his favorite line. And whenever Billboard and Cashbox and all those was going on, he always said there was payola there. I used to think he don't know what he's talking about, but it turned out, yeah, there was payola there. That makes me think too, there's two questions there. First one was um, when you came from Shreveport to Nashville, what was it like being introduced to the entertainment industry? How, did, how, did, how was that for you coming from a normal life into George Jones' world? Me coming into George Jones's world? Yeah, in Nashville. And it, the entertainment business, which you ended up immersing yourself it in and being scary. successful. Because I always felt like before I learned it all, I could sit back and see that they were cheating him. But how do you prove it? And they used to say, 
Oh, Lord, she's coming to town today. Y'all be get prepared. Rick Blackburn, especially. You remember Rick? I do. Rick said, she's as dumb as a fox, but here she comes. But I always went straight to Rick's office, and Rick always lied. I was. Always. It doesn't matter what it was. If he said the check was coming next week, as soon as you finished that album, it wasn't there. Or they'd find a reason that, well, you didn't pay this and that and this, George, so you didn't get a check. Well, one day, I had this big old skirt on, my cowboy boots on. I was looking cool, honey. <laughs> I had my tape recorder. So I put my tape recorder here. I was going to tape Rick Blackburn that day. Now, I know you lie, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to prove it to you. Well, dead gummit, I went like this to cross my leg, and my dead gum tape recorder fell on the floor. <laughs> Batteries went everywhere, and Rick was like, you're taping me. Yes, because you tell lies, Rick. I, I just wanted the truth. <laughs> Rick used to tell that story all the time. That's I know it sounds just like me, don't it? <laughs> Earlier you were talking about um, Alabama. And when you first came into George's life, and something I've always, uh, I'm a little unclear on, was Suge Baggett still in George's no. life? He was gone. No. Suge was, was gone. Out. Okay. So there were there were other folks, but Suge was gone. Okay. Suge was out. Right. And then my last question is: is uh, what was George's favorite song? What was George's favorite George Jones? Song? George's favorite song, I have to say, would be "Someday My Day Will Come," because he always said, "Everybody's run over me and." Someday my day will come. Oh, the right left hand. Well, the right left hand came out later, but. Oh, but he loved it. Yeah, he loved that song too. But the older songs, yeah. Someday my day will come. Wonderful. I have a couple of questions. Oh, we got another. Please. Other. Hey. Um. So I imagine you all got pitched a lot of uh, business ideas to, for to put George's name on. So what would be questions you would ask? Before you would say yes, what were you looking for, and what are some things you turned down, or what were some ridiculous things that came your way? Well, a lot of it was run through a girl that was a, supposed to be a business manager, but she knew nothing anyway. I knew more than she did. But um, you try to figure out, okay, how much upfront money you're going to get. Then you work on the royalties, and if the if the royalties is like three percent or four percent you run because you know you're never going to get it anyway and that's what george used to say ask for a hundred thousand up front because that's all you're going to get anyway so a lot of that was hard to get it past george because his favorite number was a hundred thousand so uh, a lot of stuff was done that way which i never really liked because he wouldn't let me get in there and really fight for the royalties or see what they were selling and all of this stuff. Just give me a hundred thousand. You can use my name. George would have sold his name and likeness if he could have for a hundred thousand. I never, ever let him do that. I will go to my grave owning George's name and likeness. And then, um, so many of us have or will have an addict in our family. I, my sister was an alcoholic. What advice do you have for people who might have an addict in their family um, having gone through that experience? Having an addict, is that what she's saying? Yeah, yeah. Somebody in their family. It's, um, first of all, like I said, you don't nag them. You pray a lot. You gotta have patience. You have to have patience. And you can't tell them every day, you gotta go, you gotta go check in rehab. You gotta go check in rehab. You have to be there for them. You gotta have the patience. And once they start seeing that and knowing that there's there is love there, because somehow or another they feel like the love is gone. And they're battling this all by themselves. And once that you you can get them to realize you can easily say, oh, I love you. I don't do that. You, They will feel it and know when you really mean that you love them. And it's a, it's a mind thing. You got addicted to pain pills after George died. I did. I had, um, what kind, what surgery was it? What's that? I forgot what surgery. Code. Oh, your back surgery? I had, when I had my back surgery, this is how easy it is to get addicted. I got addicted on pain pills. Because it caused neuropathy. And, so if she had night, yeah. her legs were just freaking so, so bad. 
I would take pain pills. And then one day I said, I, I don't want to, I, I just want to quit. Well, you go to the doctor and you know what? No, let me write you another prescription and another prescription. So mm -hmm. before I got COVID in 2021, yeah, 2020, you're cool. I, in 2020, uh, in May the 18th, I said, I'm through. I, I, I can't do this anymore. I couldn't think right. I had a temper and I just, everything was not right. So uh, one morning I said, I'm through with this. So I got them and I cut them to fourth, a half, I mean a half, a fourth, and lead old bitty until I didn't want it anymore. And it's a good thing because when I got COVID, just think if I had been hooked on pain pills right. and COVID at the same time, since I already died. Mm -hmm. And then there's another thing that I was going to tell you that God helped me with because I have. There was something in your head. You said, I'm stopping. And so a lot of the mind shift in your mind. Yeah, it, it is. It's a lot of it's in your mind. I mean, if you really want to quit, you can do it. I mean, I was a bear. Anything dropped on the floor, I was just going to scream. But I got off of it. And then I got COVID. But then uh, I have neuropathy really bad. So. My daughter had told me about this thing that they insert in you, and it'll like give you the fill your body with the pain inside your body. Well, I kept thinking, "Oh God, do I do this? Do I don't do this? Do I do this?" And it was just like God kept telling me, "You don't want to do that." Well, look, I got COVID. I died. Just think, if I would have had that in me, they would have had to do surgery to get it out. So it's all up here. Mm -hmm. And I still have neuropathy. I, some days it's worse than others. And I got neuropathy from the drug dealers uh, beating me so bad, but it's okay. I'm alive and I'm gonna preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus and I ain't gonna stop. Yeah. How did, when you were going through the tough times with George, how did you take care of yourself and uh, how did you not lose a sense of yourself with such a big personality? Well, a lot of times we didn't eat. And when we did, it was, what's that old stupid thing I can't stand on 96? Steak and shake? Cracker Barrel? No. Oh, I don't know. It's what? a little bitty hamburgers. No. White Castle. White Castle. And it's kind of like Crystal. 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 Oh, man, I gag if I even think of going through there again. George loved Crystal. Now, he would live on crystals. Well, I would eat them, but I hated them. And he loved sardines. I'd eat them, but I hated <laughs> But that's what we lived on. And here it is, the great George Jones. And I took his money, I did this, and I ripped him off. Well, for Thanksgiving, we had spam. And, you know... I don't like spam anymore either, but that's, you ate whatever was there so you could survive. So, when I was small, I probably weighed 105 pounds, but it, you just learned to survive. Mm -hmm. So, that's my life. And how would you not lose your sense of self, like, to still have your own interest and, because you know, you're credited with saving George's life. And that was all I was interested in. Okay. No, I. So there was no hobbies or no nothing. No, there was nothing there, except every day figuring out what can I do today to get him to stop. What can I do today? My whole, what can I cook today? Maybe he'll eat it. That was my whole life. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. I mean, to whoever you have that's addicted. It's not easy, but you, if you love them, you, you hang in there. And, and let me tell you, like I said, the first step is God and he will help you. Mm -hmm. He did me. Sometimes I think he wasn't there, but he was there. Well, I know I really look forward to reading your book. Oh, goody. Is there anywhere you can pre-order? 
pre order. Yeah, we're working on that right yeah. now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. He's in pre order. Well, is that it for questions? Do you want to share the title, the, the working my title? The title of my book is Walk Through This World With Me My Journey with George Jones. Yeah, let's thank Nancy thank Jones and the man. Nancy, I was going to tell you, you were talking about the George Jones miniseries that came out and what you didn't like. What was hard for me, I thought they were great actors, but I, the singing, I, I couldn't get past the the not hearing the, the vocals, you know. <laughs> that, was a, that was tough. Yeah. But, Is that because I didn't want to pay for the masters? Huh? They didn't want to pay for the masters? Is that why they sing it? She's saying, uh, you mean the I, guys that sing in George's? It's a tribute to George. No, 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 no. The miniseries. The miniseries. Mini oh. mini Is it because y'all wouldn't let them have the masters? Don't you put y'all in there. That was, that, <laughs> was George, that was Georgette. No. Okay. So yeah, nothing I, can't to believe, us. It, I, can't, I wondered why they didn't use the masters. Is it they were not given the permission? Knows. Or they I didn't know. want to pay Everything for in there is a lie. That's well, she's just trying to figure out the music. The, the music... To me, I would have uh, played George's music. I'd have played Tammy's because neither one of those people could sing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the thing about it is, is that I had nothing to do with it. I, George had worked on this in 2010 and we never knew it and George was still alive then. Wow. So she should have said something to her dad then that she was going to do this. She never did. So it came out in 2010. Uh, 13? What's that? The show. It just came out this year, wasn't it? 2010, she tried to start it. No, I know, but when did it come out? I think just it came out this, this year. year. Yeah, yeah. But it, uh, I didn't watch it. I don't want to watch it. I watched the first part, which was such a lie. He didn't shoot up no bus. <laughs> I, I know what happened there. But the guy that was driving the bus went to sleep and wrecked the bus. And George ended up with a broken wrist from that. But they have it that he was shot up the bus and he did. And it. Now, I'm sure he did a few things in there that I don't know about, that someday I might get brave enough to look, but I don't think so. And trust me, I know he didn't walk over to Tammy's bus and start kissing on her while me and Richie's supposed to be in there collecting money. You don't do that anymore. It goes into an office. And besides that, George would be too lazy to walk from his bus. Plus, <laughs> <laughs> he was married to you by the uh, way. Yeah. <laughs> and that was supposed to be in 95 when that happened. Hmm. Well, in 95, an agent would book the shows. All the money came into the office. You didn't do anything but do a show. And they had it, me and Richie in there trying to collect the money. And uh, Kathy Cheryl told me all this. And then... Uh, George over there kissing all over Tammy has it ends like they're still in love. He ain't gonna walk from his bus over to Tammy's bus. There's no way. And if he did, he wouldn't have kissed her either. Oh God no. Cause George, bless his heart. He told her one time she was looking so bad. He said, Now Tammy, I wanna know something before I get on that stage and we start singing like this right here and you spit on me. Do you have AIDS? <laughs> so I don't think he would have been kissing her. <laughs> That's how George would talk to Tim. I got. Sorry. I have another question for you. You worked on the one album, the la the George and Tammy album. Did Tony? Did Tony Brown or Emery produce that? Tony Brown. Tony Brown. How did? Because you were telling me about how George and Tammy went at it, even oh. you know later on. How did they go about agreeing on which songs they would cut for that album? The songs were sent to them by whoever wrote them, whatever went on. One would go to Tammy, one, you know, the writers would send them there. And then uh, George would say, I don't like that one. Or George would say, let's do this one. Then I'd call Tammy and Richie and, yeah, he, she feels the same, so let's do those. They didn't even go to the studio together. Right. George went in, did his part. Tammy did her part. And then the album was put together. So you and Richie kind of acted as mediators on some things. That's to... it. That's all we were. Because I still don't know how to produce an album. But, like I said, them working together and doing the tour was terrible. But when they got on the stage, I'm like, 
You little boogers. All I'm going through to get y'all on the stage and you're sitting up there acting like you in love, singing them songs and get off the stage. And oh my God, it was holy. I'm not singing with her tomorrow night. Or go see what she's going to wear. She better not wear that miniskirt. And skinny legs. I mean, it just went on and on and on. Was it um, was it worth it career wise? Did the the you know everybody loved seeing and hearing George and Tammy together? Was it good for their career solo to do that? One? George says no, but I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was. To me, I've never seen anyone the voices blend together like those two, and they were wonderful together. But Lord. It was heck to play when it was over. I went over there one night and Tammy was mad at Richie because he wouldn't give her some drugs. Richie come and got me. Come here, you gotta help me with Tammy. I go over there, she had done through all the dishes out on the floor at the bus, broke every dish in there. I said, wow, man, and I like those dishes. And she's like, oh, I would have not broke them if you wanted them. That was how she was. So then I said, well, hey, what you going to wear tonight? I play like the dishes wasn't on the floor. Broke. So she showed me this really mini skirt. <laughs> and she was going to wear some go-go boots. I said, oh, Tammy, you know what you wore like two nights ago? Oh, did you like that blue suit? Yeah. You think that looked better? I said, oh, Lord, yes. And she said, okay, I'll wear that for you. She said, I ain't wearing that for Jones. I said, it doesn't matter. Wear it for me. So I had to go every night to see what she was going to wear. Did y'all ever talk about George, you and Tammy? No. 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 Yeah, you say, you know how no. he is. Well, when he made her cry. Right. I mean, you, you had... Whenever. You would say, you know how he is. We were in England. She went over 15 minutes. He wanted me to go unplug her. I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> go unplug her or I'm not going on. I said, well, you know what? I'm at the point that I don't care. I don't care if you don't go on. So she finally comes coming down the steps and he's going up and he, oh, he said some ugly things to her. She started crying. She goes to her little dressing room. I go behind her and George's like, yeah, go run to her, run to her. Don't worry about me. I'm like, oh my God. So I go in there, she's just a crime. She said, I don't know how you put up with him. He's so mean. I said, she said, I hate him. I said, well, guess what? He hates you too. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just finish this show. So she would. But well, she would say, you know how George is. I mean, you would. She would start aside. laughing when I said, he hates you too. I'd never been so glad to get a show over, to get back home. When you would go hang out with Tammy and she'd make you biscuits, what, uh -huh. would, what would y'all talk about? She always about? made biscuits. What would y'all talk it about? It was about the kids, the twins, uh, how great she thought I was. She told me one time, I tried so hard to hate you and I just can't do it. She said, you're the sweetest woman I've ever met. I'm like, well, thank you. But she was always wanting to give me something and I didn't want to take anything from her house. Take this, take that. No, 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 I don't need it. I just, we just got to talk. And that was it, but it was always about the kids. It never was about, as she called him, Jones. Did did uh, did y'all ever talk about, or did you know Melba Montgomery? Mm -hmm. Did George ever talk about working with Melba before? Yeah, he he loved Melba's singing, but he said it was nothing compared to Tammy's. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions from anybody? I got one more. Sure, Bryce. All right. So earlier you mentioned that George loved watching football. Who was his favorite team to root for? Mm. Honey, he didn't have one. He would bet on every team that Sunday that was playing. It doesn't matter who it was. And he'd have that little book, and it'd be uh, Dallas, San Francisco, whatever. He'd have that error drug, and then he'd change his mind, take the error back over here. I don't know how he ever kept up with any of that stuff. But I'll tell you what he did one time. He won. He he wasn't very good at adding. So he won one time, and it was $5,000. And uh, he told the bookie, he come to the house, and he said, you know, I got the money over there that I owe you. It's in that top drawer if you want to get it. So he said, George, you don't owe me anything. I owe you 5000 Son, you don't owe me no money. Now, I know how to add and subtract. Well, he didn't. 
<laughs> it was five thousand off. So. Uh, so George refused the money. Yeah. So Double O comes in the kitchen and he said, uh, "Nancy, he don't owe me any money, and he won't take the five thousand. I said, "Hey, give it to me." I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so you took it. And I did. <laughs> Being that, that you set up the scholarship in George's name and that George didn't have the opportunity to to get his education and, and but you know made his success well, he seventh grade. But but made his success in music. What do you think he'd say to the students here? He today? would love it. And I tell you what I think, with him off the road, not working, I think he would be sitting here talking to y'all. And I think he would talk to you after he quit drinking and smoking, he would talk to you about no liquor, right. no drinking, I mean, no uh, smoking. No I problem. think he would have really stressed that to all of y'all. We, we talk about uh, depression and how George came up, and we actually had a, uh, the founder of Porter's Call here last week, Al Andrews, that is now, they provide free counseling for artists in the entertainment business and talk about you know the kind of things that people go through in the entertainment business and kind of cover some of that because it's important well there's so many people in the entertainment business that are on drugs and alcohol that you would not believe and that's something i think i would love to work with sometimes even with when george used to be so bad the wives would come up to me and say how do you do it what do you do I mean, I love my husband, but what, what can I do? And I would sit and talk to them for hours at the concession stand. I didn't care about selling concessions. I wanted to help that one woman. And uh, sometimes I'd get a letter from him saying, you won't believe. I told my husband about how you are helping George and all of this. And I think he's, if George can do it, he's going to do it. I got a lot of letters like that. But it's just... It's so hard, so hard, and you have really, and Tammy never had the patience with George. I mean, she screamed and hollered, and which she beat up George a lot, which nobody ever knows that, but it's in my book. But anyway, um, nobody ever knew that, and he never ever put Tammy down, never. I used to say, why don't you tell them the truth? Nope, she was on drugs before George was, long before George was. He never talked about it. Nope. What about, I'm, I'm, I'm asking stuff, and I'm just being fanboy right now, but what about Tammy getting kidnapped, that whole deal? Well, you know that had to be George Ritchie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who else would have done that? She was supposed to be on the award show that night. Yeah. Remember, they tried to blame that on George, but he had an alibi, but who else would have done that? I believe it, the kids believe it. And one time Tammy pitched a fit and said yes, but then she took it back. So, I mean, sometimes he could be, he could be a little pistol too. You know, something interesting too we've seen is um, as we're going through the class and uh, when George and Tammy moved down to Florida, the, the, you know, they did commercials for Badcock Furniture right. and trade for their furniture in the right. house. And, I, and I, to the students, I put them to, uh, to them like, imagine Tim McGraw and Faith Hill or, you know, Carrie Underwood and her doing commercials. Country music was set at such a different place then mm -hmm. that, than now, you know, as far as what was what people would do, you know, what kind right. of the level of country music has changed. Oh, it's from, changed a whole lot. From then. I don't think it's country music anymore. I'm sorry. I know all of y'all are young, but um, when you get out there and you don't have hardly any clothes on, and uh, I don't know what you're saying. I mean, I love country music when I know what you're saying, and it goes to your heart, and you, 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 can, you can live it like George did. I mean, when he would sing a song, he felt it. But I don't know what they're saying, and... I um uh, I like Carrie Underwood. I think she's a great entertainer. She sings good, but why does she dress the way she does? I'm sorry. I'm I'll tell her. You know, <laughs> yes, you will. Yes, you will. <laughs> why do you dress half naked when you got a husband and two kids? I would not want my kids to see me out there performing that way. And yeah, she's got beautiful legs, but you got another way to show your legs. So, I mean. <laughs> 
I don't watch it anymore. I do not. And I don't, uh, I don't hold back because I used to say, oh, that's so cute. It's a cute outfit she had on. No, uh-uh. If you're going to go out there naked, stay at the house. That makes me think of the time you accepted the award for George. I was about to say, yep. the CMA award. Uh, uh, and you apologized to Bruce Hinton. They called George. He won an award, and he was in the bathroom. He was. And I told Bruce, Bruce, you're going to kill me. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> but I pulled it off. I but he was it. in the bathroom because he kept the little bottles in his boots, so he went to drink. Oh. People don't know that part. They think he's going to the bathroom, but he was he in said, there. You could have come and got me. I said, by the time I'd have got you and you got on the stage, it'd have been over with. But he got but mad that you went up there. <laughs> he did. He was so mad at me. I said, well, you know, Garth pushed me out there. Billy Yates told something on you last night. Oh, oh God. Billy. Billy. Uh, so he was telling us that he cut your hair, and then when you ha you had him come out there to the house to cut George's hair, and he said George, when he pulled the shears out, George kind of freaked out and said, what are you going to do? And Billy said, I shouldn't say this, but Nancy called it his helmet, talking about uh, George's hair, and he was talking about the shape or whatever, but that he was going to layer it. He but, did one time, George was like, hey, he can't cut my hair. He can't do it. But Billy he called said, the helmet, he said, his hair. He was. <laughs> but he was so sweet. Billy, Billy Yates is the sweetest man ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he is so popular overseas. Man, they that's like Elvis going over there. Yeah, he, 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 great, he gave a great interview and talked about playing songs for George and writing for him and, you know, then becoming friends and uh, getting to know you by cutting your hair. And we, we had a, we recorded a great interview with him last night. That's right. He, um, uh, one Christmas in Brentwood, and uh, he was getting married to Nancy. And uh, he said, can we get married at your house? And I said, I mean, I don't care. I would love for you to get married, but i got to get my Christmas lights up. And he said, well, get your lights up. We'll just get married in the house. Well, I was out there working, putting out Christmas lights, and he's in there getting married. <laughs> he tells that story. Nancy didn't even come in, and George was in the bathroom. <laughs> He, uh, he told the story last night that uh, uh, after they got married, everybody's visiting everything, and he couldn't, uh, he said, where's mom and dad? Where's, you know, where are my in-laws? And he said they went back there, and uh, they were looking at George's suits in his closet. They were they like, y'all got to get out of here. You can't be. You just outed him. <laughs> That's all, he, he, he did it on video, Hadley. It's, all, it's four little suit videos. Yeah, he had a wonderful. And we took his, his dad was absolutely ate up with George Jones. But... I hope that I didn't bore y'all. No, we enjoyed it so much. Can, can we get a can we get a picture with, with the class? I'm gonna post it on George's Facebook. Oh, yeah. wonderful! Well, let's let's do it. Y'all want to? Yes, let's I, do I it. I was gonna say one thing is that you know the artists talk.